<laughs> the trash can. <laughs> Okay, so, okay. okay, I'm Krista. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Faith. And our study analyzed the effect of motivation and balance on attention and memory. So we're going to present you all with two different images, and we want you to think about which one you would likely pay more attention to. So raise your hand if you think that you pay more attention to the snake image. Okay, so previous research would indicate that you would likely attend to and, mem and remember the snake image, which is considered a negative image, more than you would the bread picture, which is considered positive. Um, and so, <coughs> in addition to this, you would likely want to avoid the snake image more than you would likely want to approach the bread image. And so this poses the question of whether valence is the only difference between these two images. So with this said, um, in our study, we analyzed the difference between motivation versus valence. So in looking at valence versus attention, um, or valence and attention, previous research has indicated <coughs> that with negative valence, there's an association with a more narrowed allocation of attention, whereas with positive valence, there's an association with a more holistic or globalized allocation of attention. Um, and so as we study attention, it's also important to study memory. And so it's in, the relationship between memory and attention begins with encoding. So we see that memory begins with encoding. However, this encoding process begins with the allocation of attention, whether this is global or detailed. Um, and so in regard to the two images that we showed you guys previously, um, you might, it might be concluded that you would pay more attention to the snake image and you might remember more details about this image, such as the color of the snake or the type of the snake, more than you would the bread picture, which is considered positive. <coughs> um, so as opposed to remembering more details about the bread picture, you might just simply remember that you saw a picture of bread. So there has, there's lots of previous research um, that has looked at the effect of valence on attention. However, Gable and Harmon Jones conducted two different studies that looked at the effect of motivation on attention. Um, and so in relation to the two previous pictures that we showed you, they might argue that this motivation, um, that would, you might attend to the two different images, the snake and the bread picture, similarly, in that you're both motiv you're motivated by the two images like, in different ways. Um, and so within their study, they conducted two different studies, and they primed their participants local and global attention um, and so they asked their participants to look at different images and think of them in a more global or in a more detailed way um, and so while doing so they looked at the differences in brain activity and so they had two different studies and the first one looked at disgust versus rocks and so their overall stimuli was positive which was the desserts images shown here neutral which they used um, rock images and negative was shown through discussed images such as trash. And so in their first study, they looked at discussed versus rocks. And in their second one, they looked at desserts versus rocks. So the results indicated that there was a greater allocation of attention for the negative images as opposed to the neutral ones. Um, and they also found that there was a greater allocation of attention for the positive images as opposed to the neutral ones. However, they concluded that this was not necessarily due to valence, but rather due to motivation. And so throughout their study, we found a couple limitations. Um, the first being that you couldn't effectively compare the positive to the negative, um, just because they did use these two different stimuli in two different studies. Um, in each individual study, they just took one of the valence types and directly correlated it with a neutral stimuli. And then lastly, we also found another limitation of that. They did not give their participants um, a rating scale, and so it's really important to give your participants this so that assumptions aren't made that with the positive, <coughs> neutral, and negative stimuli, um, those weren't interpreted by the participants the same way that they were by the researchers. So through these two different limitations, um, we use these throughout our current study, and so we essentially just try to combine the aspects of both of them. 
Okay, so the way that we measured attention was through EEG, <coughs> interpreting EEG. So EEG is an electroencephalogram, and you've probably seen multiple pictures now of a cap that it's on. Uh, and so it measures the electrical activity through uh, uh, electrodes placed on the scalp uh, for brain activity. So the way that we interpreted the e, uh, EEG data was through an event-related potential, which is a way of averaging the electrical activity uh, in response to a stimulus. And so what you get when you average it is waveforms that look like that, and there's different peaks. And generally, those peaks correspond to uh, different process, neural processes that have um, different variables that affect them. And so the one that we looked at was the N1. It's the first negative deflection, and it takes place about 100 milliseconds following the presentation of a stimulus. And the reason we looked at that one is because Forrest and Hilliard in 1977 uh, found that selective attention uh, increases the amplitude of the N1, like when participants pay attention to something. So the hypotheses we had, uh, we were going to attribute to differences to valence, because that's what the larger body of the literature uh, seems to support. And we mentioned the limitations of Gable and Harmon Jones' motivational theory, so we figured it would probably be valence. So for the N1, which is that attention waveform, uh, we hypothesized that the highest amplitude would be for negative, then positive, and neutral, and there'd be no effect of motivation. For memory, we had uh, two parts of memory. There was remember, which is more detailed memory that has like contextual information, and we hypothesized that would have highest uh, responses for negative, then positive, then neutral. And for no memory, that's some more generalized memory with less detail, and we hypothesized that there would be the most no memory for positive, then negative, then neutral. So our method for the EEG was to show we hooked them up to the EEG, had the cap, and started uh, looking at the electrical activity. And we had participants look at a Navon letter test. So we've already been over this. You guys saw it. So we had, uh, we had them look at the smaller letter, which would be the S, and uh, tell, tell us that it was the S. And that would prime people for narrowed uh, attention. And the reason we did that was to sort of standardize them across attentional scope. Then we had them look at a fixation cross, and then the study image. And the study images were the negative, neutral, and positive, and we've been over that too. So the images uh, were rated via an online survey, and we tried to standardize for valence, arousal, and motivational intensity. So our method for testing memory was to have participants come in a week after they did the EEG testing. And there was basically they looked at images from the study or new images, and they had to say whether they remembered, no, or uh, saw a new image. And so you might remember this trash image because it's come up like five times now. <laughs> uh, we managed by coincidence to have the same as the previous presentation, the same trash picture, uh, whereas the cake would be something new. So what comes out of our EEG is this electrical output. So on our y-axis, we're looking at amplitude of brain activity. On our x-axis, we have time in milliseconds. Zero represents presentation of the stimulus. So then we have 100 milliseconds before, 100 milliseconds after, et cetera, all down the line. Then we have three lines here representing our three groups of valence images. Positive images in green, negative images in blue, and neutral images in yellow. So each line represents the average across all trials for all participants. So we have one electrical <coughs> output for each group of valence images. So we specifically looked at our N1 between 60 and 160 milliseconds. And we actually, when this came up, decided to add the N2, which is another um, waveform associated with selective attention between the 200 and 300 milliseconds. So again, we expected, because of the previous research from Dr. Steinmetz's lab, that we would see an effect of valence, which would mean greater amplitude for negative compared to positive. However, if we saw no difference between negative and positive amplitude, then we conclude an effect of motivation. So, interestingly enough, contradictory to everything we expected, we did actually find no significant difference between the amplitude of brain activity between positive and negative images, which suggests an effect of motivation on attention and supports the research of Gable and Harmon Jones. So then we looked at our memory results. So again, our participants were given a task where they were asked if they remembered images, which is a more detailed memory, or knew them, which is a more familiar general memory. So with our remember responses, we expect more remember responses for negative compared to positive and neutral, because negative images are attended to and remembered on a more detailed level. 
So within our participants, we did find this result, such that there was a greater number of remember responses for negative images compared to positive and neutral. So then we looked at our no responses, which is our more general memory. We expect to see higher no responses for positive compared to negative and neutral because positive images are attended to and remembered on a more general familiar level. However, that's actually not what we found. We found greater no responses for negative compared to positive and neutral. So in order to interpret this, we went back to our rating scales. Before our, before our study, we gave a group of pilot participants these three ratings of valence, arousal, and motivation. We were actually the first study that also gave those rating scales to our participants to ensure, like we mentioned before, that they interpreted the images the same way we believe they should. So our first scale is valence, which is how pleasant or unpleasant you think the image is. We expect to see high pleasant, high valence for a positive compared to most unpleasant being negative. And within our participants, we did find this to be the case. Then we looked at motivation, which is your desire to approach versus your desire to avoid. <coughs> so we expect that our participants will want to as strongly approach the positive images as strongly as they want to avoid the negative images. So again, no difference between the images. The only difference is in valence. This is also what we found in our participants. There was no difference in motivation level for positive and negative images. Our third measure is arousal, which is how exciting or agitating an image is. Again, we expect that our arousal ratings for positive and negative images should be about the same. Because again, the only thing we want these two groups to differ on is valence. However, it's actually not what we found. We found that our participants rated higher arousal levels for our positive images compared to our negative images. So we took that result and we went back to our no responses. So if we expect that positive images should have a greater no response because they are remembered on a more general level, however, previous research has also shown that high arousing images are remembered on a more detailed level, these high arousal ratings for negative images could have counteracted the expected high no responses for positive and led to this greater number of no responses for negative images, which suggests an effect of arousal on no response memory. So in closing, we were able to come to two conclusions through this. The first being that motivation does have an influence on attention, as seen through our EEG and our N1 and N2 results discussed by Rebecca. And the second being that valence and arousal do influence memory in some way, um, as seen through our remember and our no results also discussed by Rebecca. Um, and so although attention is a precursor for memory, there are several different factors that make memory a little more complex than that such as like the consolidation and the retrieval of these memories. And so with that said, um, this is when valence and arousal might come into play. So in conclusion, um, attention and memory are in fact influenced by different factors. <coughs> so we give a huge thanks to Dr. Steinmetz for helping us throughout this semester. Um, also thanks to Kim, Paige, Abby, Taylor, Timmy, and Sam, all of our lab assistants. We actually would still be running participants if it was not for them. And finally, thanks to um, our physics helpers. So Amanda, Lillian, Sheldon, and TJ, thank you so much for all of your help. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Questions? All right, last group is up.